Hi, I'm Freddie Lim, the vocalist of Sonic and a member of parliament in Taiwan. And I'm Emily Waiwu, co-founder of Ghost Island Media. And this is Metalhead Politics, our new podcast on some of our favorite things. Music, politics, and Taiwan. Yes, the Taiwan part, especially. Metalhead Politics. This is our first episode, Freddie. Tell our listeners why we're here and what they can expect. Well, music-wise, you're here. Uh, music-wise, you're here. Some uh, newest music from Sonic uh, and other Taiwanese metal bands. Sonic will release a new single every once in a while since we haven't toured for years now. So instead of coming to our show, I come to you with this podcast. All right, just in case if you've never heard a song by Kathonic, am I saying that right? Kathonic. Uh, uh, we call Sonic according to the dictionary, yeah, but I don't really care because the European call Chathonic and the Americans call Chathonic, and so I... I'm fine with anyone. Anyway. But you call, okay. but when you when you um when, when formed I'm the band stage, back in the nineties, yeah, I I I call it Thonic. Thonic, yeah. Okay, Thonic. <laughs> All right. So that you heard a bit of that theme song by Thonic, and we'll hear more songs by Thonic this time around. But you've never heard any songs by Thonic. I think there's a couple of things you need to know. It's really hardcore, like really hardcore. It's really cool. But also, I think what I love about it is that. Every song is about Taiwan, right? It's about Taiwan history, it's about yep. Taiwan stories, personalities, and so we'll hear you talk about some of those things. Yes. Stop number one on our Metalhead Politics Tour. What is it? Democracy. Democracy in times of crisis. Right. So we'll talk politics. Cut that line. Hate it. Okay. All right. The crisis, obviously, is... The... All right. The crisis, obviously, is the COVID pandemic. Right, so across the world right now, governments are debating whether to reopen and how to reopen. And what that means, it's different for every country, every government, but... Freddie, as a lawmaker in Taiwan, what does it mean to you to reopen? I think Taiwan did a lot of things right heading into this crisis, but uh, it also had a lot of power to do things right. And... um, But it also had a lot of power to do things right. An emergency protocol was activated and it gave the government certain powers it normally didn't have. To reopen would mean an end to these special powers. So these are some of the things that we learned from SARS 2003. Yes, after SARS, we changed our law and we expanded the power the government could have during a health crisis while also maintaining rule of law. That sounds good. What's the problem? When the virus broke out, we gave the when when the virus broke out, we gave the government certain power to control the crisis. The government got the power, but there are still some gray areas that need more clarification. Tai, uh, Taiwan is a de- uh, Taiwan is a democratic country, and a democratic government can just do whatever the fuck it wants, whenever it wants. Even in crisis, it's a part of our challenge. Yeah, well, I agree with that, but like, well, hold on, just to clarify, the we, you said a couple of times, we, this is lawmaker we, or this is people we? I think, for me, of course, uh, we, the lawmakers, but I would say we, the people, uh, only temporarily, and we need to make sure they don't abuse this power. Okay, um, okay, we'll expand on this in a bit, but before yeah. that, I want to ask you something. So, crisis here, obviously, it's the, the COVID pandemic. Um, across the world, governments are talking about how to reopen. So this means different things for everybody, right? In the US, uh, what does it mean for the upcoming election? For the EU, what does it mean to reopen when you have different countries within a union doing having different rules? For Taiwan, I think, right? It's it, We're talking about perhaps opening traveling or, or whatnot. As a lawmaker, Freddie, what does it mean to you to reopen? I think reopen this word is kind of different in Taiwan because we didn't lock down. So, so we didn't really close this country. So for me, I would say that because during this crisis that we authorized, uh, uh, we authorized certain powers to the government that they didn't usually have. So for me, it was say, it, uh, to reopen, it means that uh, uh, we, we put an end to these powers. 
So these are our powers that I think were put in place um, after we came out of the SARS experience in 2003. Uh, yes, after SARS, uh, we changed our law and we expanded the power the government could have during a health crisis uh, and while also uh, maintaining rule of law. That sounds good. <laughs> What's the problem? Uh, the problem is that uh, we live, uh, Taiwan is a democratic country, so we can't just let the government do what the uh, do whatever they want. Uh, it's not that easy that to just let the government to feel like to start the power and then to end up uh, whenever they want. It's more like how we can control the government to expand their power and when we think the power should be taken back, then I think we should try to, moni uh, we should try to uh, monitor the government carefully and to uh, try to stay on the same page with the government and to let the government feel like they, are be, they have been monitored. So China, having failed to contain the outbreak when it broke out in Wuhan as early as December or earlier, um, they're now trying to win on a blitz to try to claim the title of world savior, right? They've even gone, <laughs> they've even gone as far as to say that, look, we're, we're dealing with this so well because we are an authoritarian state. So as a democratic elected official, what do you what do you say to that? I think that's just I think I just answer that uh, I think I just answer that question uh, in the in the earlier one because I, when I say that something uh, quite something different from a democratic country to an authoritarian country is just that China can do whatever they want. The Chinese government when whenever they want to cover up the story or or when they want to to sell the propaganda that they are the world savior and their people cannot have, a, they, they couldn't have a different story. They couldn't have sell the different version of the story. I think that's the problem that, that the, I think that's what I want to mention. And also the Chinese government, their stories about beating the coronavirus has, uh, no matter their stories about beating the coronavirus have as many holes as the face masks they are shipping. They are still sell. They are still selling this version of the story, and their numbers are not to be trusted. Meanwhile, in democratic countries like what I have said in Taiwan, we can try our best to hold government leaders accountable. Here in Taiwan, every afternoon there's uh, there's a public statement with reliable numbers and reliable science. Otherwise, we'll grill them in the parliament. That's the real Taiwan miracle, renewed every day, and that's not gonna happen in China. So Taiwan is just a, we are just 90 minute flight away from China. Um, and I, so I was looking up the, the statistics the other day, it, it, was, it was scary. So in nine, so just last year in 2019, there was an average of 5,750 flights between Taiwan and China every month. So we're looking at 191 flights every day on average, right? So this really could have been a catastrophe for Taiwan. Um, Freddie, you mentioned earlier about emergency protocol. So, yeah, so that's why, the, the, according to a lot of uh, researchers and uh, uh, scholars uh, worldwide, they okay, they they all they all consider Taiwan would be very serious, uh, would be uh, facing a very serious of problems during this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, I feel so lucky to be here right now. Um, and but from where you were in Parliament, what were some of these emergency protocols that were put in place? Uh, Taiwan, uh, we acted fast. By December thirty-first, we had sent a note to the WHO about the possible danger. I'm laughing because WHO is a trigger word right now. <laughs> yeah, we. But we did tell them that that there is there. Yeah, there is a possible danger of the new virus. But they ignored us. Yeah, just like, yeah, obviously, they ignored us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, so, so, so I think WHO, they just, uh, when it comes to Taiwan, their attitude is who cares? The, the WHO motto is health for all except for Taiwanese because it has adopted China's light that Taiwan is a part of China. 
Um, so we're recording this before the WH8 assembly. Um, mm. As of today, it's still going back and forth between kind of the world's um, lobbying mm. efforts for Taiwan to be and part I, of the WHA. I don't think they're gonna. There's gonna anything new happen. Yeah, yeah I don't. Yeah, think, we, we will yeah. still be blacked out. Yeah, I don't think anything's <laughs> gonna happen outside like, of the useless meeting. <laughs> Can I say that? Yeah, we're just gonna let that die. Just gonna <laughs> dip the silence. Just let that hope die. Just, yeah, died. Um, right. So, so the next day after we contacted the WHO back in December 31st, the next day on January 1st, we started. Um, Taiwan started health checks for passengers flying in from Wuhan. And so, oh, oh, and oh. and and that was. I mean, in fact. We were kind of acting alone, right? Um, mm. Talking about not being a part of the WHO because when we did that, uh, ten days later, the WHO had actually put out an advisory to say it did not recommend people, it did not recommend um, states to screen passengers. Mm, but, but we don't care. So we, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we restricted flights from China and quickly set up a quarantine rules for anyone. Actually, we have done. All the things that all the other governments would do a few months later than us, and uh, and we uh, rationed uh, surgical masks. We started contact tracing back in January. We began social distancing and had an uh, integrated database of exactly who were infected, their travel history, and also made sure they were properly quarantined. Actually, I want to. Uh, Emphasize again that we did all these a few weeks before all the other countries did the same thing. Right. I'm, uh, okay. Uh, I want to emphasize once again that we have done all these uh, measures uh, a few weeks before the other governments done the same thing. I mean, it's really a just just that. I mean, it's really a blessing in the skies, right? That we were able to. We knew what to do. Uh, precisely because we went through SARS, and that's not a good experience, right? And so, mm. you know, but but I do remember. I, I think that um, I remember the early days of COVID. Um, I felt like all of us, people, all everybody around me, just went on this emergency mode. It, it was like we turned on the switch, right? Um, we knew it was going to get bad, and we. And it was really cool because we trusted our government to know exactly what it was doing. Our VP, um, who he just finished his term last week, he was a health minister during the SARS response, right back in 2003. And so I remember it would, you know, kind of word was getting out that we need to be really careful. And my mom, you know, at home, my mom <laughs> went to our shelves and she just dug up all these masks that we had from SARS. And so masks wasn't a problem. Um, so we had masks and we just started, we, we said, okay, we need to wear this every day. We need to wear this when we go out. We need to keep our distance from each other. We just kind of, you know, yeah, turn on the switch, switch. Yeah, turn on the switch to the emergency mode. And even my, <coughs> even my colleagues in my uh, par uh, parliament, even my colleagues in my office and also my wife, my uh, my relatives, they all switch to uh, emergency mode. And only me, I'm kind of a layback person, and so I'm the last one to 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 figure it out that oh, I should turn on the switch mode as well. But even me, I'm much earlier than my friends who live in other countries. So I always the one that left behind in my relatives, my friends. I always don't care about that kind of shit, and I always say that ah, that's not that important. That's not that risky. And but even me, I'm quite ahead than all the other friends in other countries in Japan, in the U.S., in Canada. I can see all my friends who who didn't really care, didn't really give a shit about this pandemic, and and I used to be the same same guy. And in Taiwan, but even me, I have been triggered. I have been warned. I have been reminded that no, this is not a time for you to lay back. Yeah, you should turn on your emergency mode. I turn on my emergency. I turn on my emergency mode. Yeah, a few days later than my friends, and even me, I still ahead of the other friends in other countries. So what I want to say is that so. I think Taiwan, even me, I, I have dodged, <laughs> I have dodged this uh, virus. So today is mid-May. There has been only over 
400 cases in Taiwan and fewer than 10 deaths. Even the WHO, uh, which usually checks on the world, Taiwan, had to admit we have done a good job. Yeah, I'm super, uh, I'm super thankful of this kind of collective agreement, right, that we all have, and it's kind of how we're still here today. Um, kind of around the world, millions of people have lost their jobs, you know, film shoots are paused, concerts are paused, and hmm. we are here, like, I count, like, there's like 12 of us in this room. Um, we're, we launched a new project. I mean, this is it's an incredible time to be in Taiwan right now. Yeah, um, I feel a, a bit guilty. Right. Yeah, like when my friends, they've been locked in their houses and, and their restaurants are closed, their uh, shops are closed, and I still went to some fine restaurants with my wife. Yeah. And, and yeah. I can't yeah. really... I, I didn't share with my friends. I, I just feel like a bit guilty. But yeah, it's actually even our baseball. Yeah, still playing. And I, I think we are blessed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think there is that guilt. And um, I still struggle on how to tell the Taiwan story sometimes to my friends abroad. Like, I feel like an asshole to say, yeah, we're okay. <laughs> but okay, so there, there's been a lot of talks about you know, what we've done well. Um, so for us to not sound like an asshole, tell us something bad. Like, <laughs> yeah. what, what do we do wrong? Yeah, but, uh, but actually uh, in the parliament, I always feel like we can still do something better. Yeah, there is one thing I feel we could have done better. Uh, so we never formally declare state of emergency. I think that's some, it's, it's not really a right uh, process. Okay, uh, just because you're a lawmaker, so can you define that for me, what you mean by that, in, in your very lawmaker terms? Mm, for me, a state of emergency allows a de democratic society to temporarily uh, suspend its normal civil protections and begin whatever is necessary to deal with the crisis. So during COVID, uh, this means that the Taiwan government could put in place a national quarantine. That's a lot of power. Right, right. So when, when this is over, um, the theory or the practice should be that our system goes back to its original place. Yes, you need laws for that expansion of power. You also need laws stating the spirit of the expansion and the extent of these powers. That makes sense. That sounds like a citizen. That makes sense. Again, what is the problem? <laughs> uh, our government didn't actually declare a state of emergency. No, I heard you the first time. But what does that mean? Because we went on a state, right? We went, right, so the people, like, we went on the state of emergency on our own, kind of, yes. we switched on yes. mode. Yes. And we, there was all these different uh, uh, policies that were implemented. Um, but what do you mean by the, what do you mean that we never That's, declared a state of emergency? Uh, uh, we acted like it. We, we acted in our own emergency mode. Facing different pandemic, we might need different uh, ad administrative level or uh, legislative levels measures to fight all these uh, virus and and uh, but this time it's really a dangerous one and so we all know that the COVID situation the COVID crisis uh, has grown so fast so the old ways that the government uh, used to fight against other pandemic uh, might not work. So, right, I mean, it was 17 years ago. Right? Yeah, so yeah. our government soon found out that they have to take some emergency measure. Uh, the, the, the government soon out, uh, the, our government soon found out that they have to take some emergency measures which limit people's constitutional rights. So which means that's not on a, a mini, uh, that's not on a administrative level. Right, so it's these actually are actually a constitutional level stuff that you are trying to do. So, so these are example. special laws, sorry. So these yeah. are special laws that didn't exist normally and that, that are put in place now. Are these things that you, you voted on specifically in uh, Congress? Yeah, yeah. We passed that, that law uh, in this February, but we didn't really know that what kind of certain measures that have been uh, uh, put on by the government to fight against this crisis. So the government tried to use this law to, uh, to expand their powers and to, to then, so uh, step by step, then they went, for me, kind of too far to limit the people's constitutional right. And so, we, uh, for example, they banned certain kinds of personnel, uh, medical workers, students for leaving the country or use location data to track people who are in quarantine. These measures violate people's freedom of mm -hmm, movement mm -hmm. and right to privacy. 
So now all these emergency measures were authorized through the law. Was that, that one law? You. Was that one law uh, that said yeah, I give actually, you the right to do X Y Z, whatever you want down the future that you think is necessary, or is this, or that every time they want to do something new, you need to vote on it? You as uh, no, not really. That's all. They they done all these things according to one law. Oh. Thank God that we live in a democracy. So it doesn't it doesn't mean that we can do nothing about it. So so whenever they try to uh, place a new measure, then we can try to we can oversight all these measures and we can make sure all these measures will be uh, finished, will be uh, gone after this uh, pandemic. So which means without the constitutional level of a state of emergency, we can still do a lot of things, just, but just those responsibilities falls on us, all the members of the parliament. So I have been, I have been quite participate in all these oversight process. So, wait, but you said it was just one law. So how is it different from, it's just that it's technically not called the state of, the, of emergency? Uh, it, we, uh, when, according to the constitution, yeah. Uh, the president declare uh, the president declare a state of emergency, which means it's a constitutional level of stuff. So uh, the government uh, doesn't. So in that case, the government doesn't uh, violate our rights through administrative level. Is there is a, they they uh, they doing things according to the constitution, and then so which means it will remind people that it's not ordinary. It's, it's something constitutional level. Okay. Yeah. So, so it sounds like you're saying that under normal circumstances, uh, you're saying that if we had declared the state of an emergency, once it is over and we say emergency is now over, yeah. everything that was established during this time, yeah. I think it's taken away. Yes. But now you need to do it one by one. Yes. Yes. But, but, but thank God we are in democracy, so we can still do things one by one. But in China, if you are in China, actually they, they, Oh, they do things one by one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they by do, the one. Yes, uh, even far ahead when there was no pandemic, they monitor their citizens, and they even come so, and went so far had a social credit system okay. monitoring everybody. So, so I think during this crisis, what kind of powers they have expanded? All those powers will will just stay there. Right. Nobody can take right. that away from their government. That's the problem. That's the authoritarian regime's problem. Regime's problem. Yeah. Yeah. So these are very kind of national level policies to contain the virus, right? And there are other things that um, to avoid the spread of fake news, uh, fines for you know not even wearing a mask on the M MRT. What do you tell your daughter about this? Because because I have this question because I was hanging out with my friend's kid the other day and she really didn't want to to wear the mask on the MRT, right? And you tell her, we have to do this because there's something really serious going on in the world and we all need to do this. That is utterly not comprehensible to her. Hmm. And finally I said, well, you know, or you can just pay $500 US dollars because that's the fine for it. She's like, oh shit, okay. <laughs> but that's, I think that's because uh, your friend's daughter, uh, he's old enough to understand what, uh, what money means. My daughter, my daughter is only three years old. He does, uh, she doesn't know anything about money. So what I have told her is that uh, there are there are many small viruses like Bai uh, Kimang, you know, Ampamang. That's the Japanese children. That's the Japanese uh, Japanese cartoon for children. And so there are virus men. Virus men in the air, small virus men everywhere. So you uh, you need to put on your mask and uh, to avoid all those uh, virus men uh, try to sneak into your mouth. So then she was like, "Okay, I I I don't really think she buy my story, but but I think she has found out that I try very hard to convince her. So she just like, okay, 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 Dad, I listen to you." So she doesn't mind at all when you Don't go out. Don't try to tell me any <laughs> stupid stories anymore. So, so you go out, you put on a mask on her, she's like, okay, fine. Yeah, because she found out that I want to tell her another long and stupid <laughs> quest, uh, story again. Can you share with us <laughs> one of these stories? <laughs> I always try to, 
I, I always try to uh, tell, tell her some very stupid stories like small rhinos, small elephants, like in the virus size, so they are very poisonous. So all those small elephants, small rhinos, when they sneak into your stomach, then you get sick, things like that, and she doesn't buy it. <laughs> I was going to say, can we make a children's book about this? But then now you're like, ah, oh, she doesn't no, she, she it. just doesn't buy it, and she feel like, Okay, I know you just want to convince me to put on my mask. Okay, I, I listen to you, but don't, <laughs> don't try to sell me all these stupid stories anymore. So, yeah. So that's my, my way, because she doesn't know anything about the fine and money. Yeah, uh, yeah so. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, with that, um, we're going to take a break and listen to some, some, some rhino stories. Um, <laughs> That is super cute. Um, I would like to hear that story. <laughs> I think some of, maybe we'll have it as a bonus content sometime. Kind of, Freddie tells the story. I'll let you know which stories uh, work uh, and which, which doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, just here, yeah, testing it on her. It's great. Yeah. Welcome back to Metalhead Politics. I'm Emily Waiwu. Hi, I'm Freddie Lim. And we've been talking about democracy in times of crisis. This is our new podcast on music, politics, and Taiwan. Taiwan. I want to say Taiwan too. Uh, Okay, so Freddie, earlier we talked a lot about kind of the Taiwan response, um, and we touched just a little bit on some of these things that you said that we gave the government power to do uh, because we are in the crisis. These things that you, as a lawmaker, that you think should be, need to be taken back once the crisis is over. Yes. So as a citizen, we will be here to make sure you also do your job. Yes. (laughs) Uh, So there's a lot of, I know that, you know, for the government, there's a lot of surveillance going on, right? Mm. Kind of necessary surveillance for this time. And it's a crucial part of also what's made Taiwan's response so successful so far, hmm. right? So it's things like when you're in quarantine, um, your movements are watched so closely by the police, right? There's there's tales of people who even when their phones um, run out of battery and immediately they get a knock on the door by the police. And say, yes. Okay, are you still here, right? Because it's a big, big problem if you break quarantine. And when we ha- when we know that we, we haven't had a lot of positive cases in Taiwan is about 440 as of this week. Um, And when they know that there's ever a group outbreak and when there's a known group case, um, the police, they can trace the past locations of this group and me, right? And they'll send me a text message to say, hey, you were once, this person receiving your text, you were once in close proximity with people who are now positive. This is, this is, sorry. And they know this because cell cell phone towers, right? Yeah. Is this this is surveillance? Uh, yes, it's kind of unsettling. But in terms of keeping the numbers down, it worked. Like I said, I think these measures should be uh, imposed after we declare a state of emergency. And but but anyway, so but, but, but hold on. <laughs> so, so walk me through the the mechanisms though. So my location is known to the government because. You know, uh, I use Far Eastern Telecom, so they have my location at all times because it's paying the cell towers. How is the government yeah. getting this information? There is a digital platform uh, built, uh, established this February and integrate data from different databases, including those from the telecoms in Taiwan. And that's how they can track your location. This data can only be checked by the CDC or their personnel uh, with their authorization. Right, so it's CDC that has the access to this, but it's actually the central command center for the virus that was set up this February. Yes. So it's not, so it's a special unit of the CDC that's getting this data. Yeah. Along with? Uh, with National Communication Commission. Right, that has yeah. access to the telecoms. Telecoms, yeah. Um, so they, they also use this platform to build a uh, now famous digital fence to keep track of people in quarantine through cell phone data and daily line message checks. So that's where you get all those messages from. And the officials will be alerted if someone in quarantine leaves the uh, designated area. So if you happen to be in quarantine, better keep your phone charged. 
I mean, <laughs> yeah. And this is, was this under the bundle that you talked about kind of earlier on the show about this one particular yeah. legislation? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's all uh, based on that one uh, law that been passed in this February. And but also I think that's some that should be in the constitutional level. Yeah. So you didn't, so lawmakers didn't specifically approve this particular uh, mechanism? Uh, no, but part of the parliamentary oversight process that ensures a robust exit mechanism for the digital fence. In digitally fencing the infected residents, many databases of personal information are linked together to serve the purpose of contact tracing. I will make sure this system stops functioning when no longer needed and the relevant databases are entirely delinked. Right, after the fact. But do you think that had there been a discussion uh, going into this, do you think that it would have been a healthy debate in Congress or do you think everybody would have unanimously said, this is great, we need to do this and I, I trust the government to do this? Uh, it's hard to tell. I think. Uh, most of the people, they just want to get through this crisis as soon as possible. But, uh, uh, but some, some members of the parliament from different parties, they all, uh, they all been noticed that this, this might be something that we have to check clearly, carefully. And so there have been cross parties, uh, members of the parliament, been in that oversight process and try to asked into details from the officials to make sure that the process and when all these digital things will be done. So outside of um, crisis management, this is this crosses into human rights, right? Yeah. And you were actually head of Amnesty International in Taiwan, right? For yeah. Five years, I think, 2010 to 2014. Yes. Had there been a lot of cases like it, like when you were with Amnesty? Um, had you seen something like this? Not maybe not in Taiwan, but kind of globally. Yeah, kind of like uh, especially in China or in some other uh, in some authoritarian regimes that they try to uh, build, they try to establish these kind of platforms to uh, monitor their citizens and to to uh, censor all the messages they have been exchanged online. So uh, this is something that we uh, during this crisis, the citizens might not feel might not look into details uh, too much. But after this crisis, they uh, definitely the citizens will feel, un will feel uncomfortable if they still be watched s so close by the government. So uh, in, the, in democracy, as a member of the parliament, we have to make sure in this stage, not uh, after the crisis, but in this stage, we have to warn, we have to remind the government that this is something you have to uh, uh, you. This is something that you have to be very careful, and you have to know that somebody is watching you. That's me. In Taiwan, do you get the sense that there is an, a higher awareness of this? I mean, in the past, it's only mostly been human rights groups that are talking about stuff like this. This time around, do you feel like more of us are? are I think uh, mostly the human rights groups, but the younger generation as well. I think the younger generations they don't want to be monitored by the government, but the old. Uh, I want to say older generations, but like my parents or my or my, the the elder citizens, they some of them they feel quite uh, they some of them they still want to go back to the martial law period. They feel like that's their uh, their happiest uh, moments of their lives. So everything's everything's is in order and everything's in the orders by the government and I, I think that but the young uh, but the younger generation feel a different way yeah no I'm glad you brought that up because <laughs> when, when this was when this first surfaced that, mm. that the government was doing this I had a friend who was like this is a huge problem I don't no it's not because I know that I trust that the government will <laughs> you know not do this after this is over uh, but then you know then he said from a government that used to have, you know, 30, 80 years of martial law. I don't know about this, right? Like, well... <laughs> yeah, so so I think that's uh, that's a good thing about Taiwan is that there are more and more younger generation of politicians now in, that, now in the political arenas, no matter in the local level or in the central level. They are, there are more and more young people who want to get involved in the politics to make sure that their rights have been protected by... Uh, younger generation ourselves. Right. So we'll be watching you. Yeah. I'll be watching the government. <laughs>
All right, so before we head into our final segment, which we get to hear the newest headbang music from Chthonic, or Chthonic if you're in Europe. <laughs> um, in Taiwan, we call it Thonic. Thonic. Yeah. Um, Never mind. <laughs> thonic. So I want to circle back to a trigger word that you said earlier, which is uh, the who. Uh, the WHO, which kind of, we've, we, it's... Uh, there's something called yunfen in, in, in Mandarin, yeah. right? It, it's, it's about this. We, it's have, this. we have no yunfen with WHO. We have no yunfen with any UN organizations. But <laughs> yunfen is this kind of force that brings people together, right? Like, if you have a friend you keep running into on the street, you might say, oh, man, we have so much yunfen. Yeah, or, but actually, it's not really a yunfen thing. It should be our right, right. to be a member of those international organizations yeah and i you know and I, I wish that we could exercise that right right i mean taiwan is barred from all of the un related organizations and events um and when we are included we have some very strange names right we're called taipei china or yes. taipei comma province of china uh chinese taipei and uh i think uh, listeners if you know there if you know of other weird names please tell us right <laughs> Um, we have st uh, strategic partnerships with countries, many countries around the world, but their top representatives here, but their top representatives here, are, but, but their top reps here are not called ambassadors, um, right? And we have about, I think, 15 actual diplomatic allies left world now, but we're afraid of losing their support. Um, and I feel like... I mean, this just gets me really sad, right? Because I'm like, we're so alone. I feel so alone. <laughs> this is so sad. And I think, and this dates back all the way back in history too, right? I think in Taiwan, we're taught that the Taiwan history, the, the, the history of this island begins in the 1500s when the Portuguese landed here and they looked at this beautiful place and they said, Formosa. So when I was in Portugal, I obviously got really excited. that I'm going to go find our roots, you know, kind of where this place was discovered. So I go to museums, I go to libraries, and there's no mention of <laughs> Taiwan or Formosa, <laughs> right? They talk mm. about during that time, they were in Japan, they were in the, there was no, this kind of, this moment that was so important to us didn't even get a footnote there. <laughs> Like, do you also, <laughs> yeah, do, do you also feel like we're, we're always alone? Yeah, not just alone, but, but even when they, uh, even when we are not alone, being treated in a weird way, like we have been called, like uh, all those organizations that we, uh, like you said that we have been called in with some strange names in some uh, organizations. Our name in the WTO is Separate Customs Territory of Taiwan, Penghu, Kinmen, and Mazu, aka Chinese Taipei. What kind of <laughs> fucking name is that? If you want to list all the islands belong to Taiwan, then why there is only Penghu Island, Kinmen Island, Mazu Island? Where is Green Island and Orchi Island? Xiaoliu Chou. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. And if you want to mention, if you want to list the cities belong to Taiwan, why there is only Taipei? Where mm -hmm. is Kaohsiung, mm -hmm. Taichung? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, it's just nonsense. I think, why do international organizations always come up with the strange names for Taiwan? I think they just try to please China. Mm -hmm. They, want, they mm -hmm. don't want to mention Taiwan in a proper way. If mm -hmm. they can try to mention Taiwan in a weird way and can please China, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they will choose mm -hmm, that path. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think that's mm -hmm. so not fair with Taiwan. And mm -hmm. I, I think it, the truth is just call us Taiwan. It's so easy. Right, but I mean, but to be fair, we also have some kind of uh, internal identity happening here. I mean, our airlines, like we have two flagship airlines. One is still called China Airlines. It's yes. very, very confusing. I've actually been at, oh, it, this is like sadly funny, but I've been at, it was at Pudong Airport, I think, in, 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 in Shanghai. Massive airport, really big between two different terminals. And there was this poor woman. She was, I don't, I can't remember what nationality it was. She's trying to check into China Airlines. And I'm coming back to Taiwan. And she gives her, you know, she's late to the flight. She's, she's sweaty. She has, like, luggage, big luggage. She checks in. And the woman just goes, sorry, yours is Air China. <laughs> <laughs> and it's. <laughs> you know, across the airport, right? And it's very confusing. Um, baseball, or our, our baseball league, that's 
recently just gotten really famous is confusingly called the Chinese, Chinese Professional League, uh, 对吧 Yeah. Chinese Professional Baseball League. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I, all these are actually all these are not invented by Taiwanese ourselves. Actually, that's one of the problem that the international community down to Taiwan. Actually, that's not we want to call ourselves China, but actually after World War Two, they dumped the the exile Chinese government, which called KMT,、mm-hmm. to Taiwan, and then. So that's, then, that's the nationalist that's the nationalist party that lost the Chinese Civil War yeah, to the Communist the Party. The exiled dictator Chiang Kai Shek brought all the China, free China, China Airlines, Chinese blah blah blah, all those, uh, uh, all those China idea names to Taiwan and force us to use that because because he's the dictator,、uh, he's the dictator, and and he asked all Taiwanese to cut to. He asked, or he banned Taiwanese people to speak in Taiwanese. All Taiwanese can only speak in Mandarin.、Uh, I got fined in school if I speak in Taiwanese.、Mm-hmm. So,、mm-hmm. and he, he、Did、and his government asked Taiwanese to call ourselves Chinese. So that's that's where we adopt. Well, actually, we adopt a shit from international community when they didn't know where to put the exiled Chinese government.、Uh, When they didn't know where to put the exiled Chinese government, they decided to just ask them or to dump them to Taiwan. So we we have been forced to deal with the the one China problem since uh, war uh, after World War Two actually. So that's something that I think we are not dealing with the Chinese problem or the the, the one China problem just now. The the thing that we the thing that Is so, make Taiwan so difficult to、uh, join the internet.、Uh, the thing is that it's so difficult for Taiwan to join the international organizations. It's not just it's not just happen right now. We、mm-hmm. deal with this kind of confused, complicated、mm-hmm. situation for decades、mm-hmm. since mm-hmm.、Uh, World War Two,、mm-hmm. when they decided to make Taiwan,、uh, when they decided to. Dump the one China problem to Taiwan and decided not to fix the international problems for us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They decided to leave Taiwan. They decided to leave Taiwan to deal with it.、Mm-hmm. Right. So I mean, it's, it's a weird country, right? It's, it's was colonized by a losing government、um, from across the strait, and then now, and then as it transitioned into democracy and into the modern world, kind of we're find we're figuring it out by ourselves how to trans. Just what to do? Like, how, how do we grow into Taiwan? Yeah,、um, and yeah, how yeah. we how we try to make our strange country to to be an independent country and rule by our own and to fix the problems by our own. But even though we still can't join the international organizations, so、right. you put an international problem to Taiwan and ask us to. Fix the problem by ourselves, and then if you want to join the international organization, then we say no. So,、yeah. so that's something that we still try to find a way out. But, but after this crisis, some of the Taiwanese feel like maybe we are in, maybe maybe we are in the right position because we are not a part of WHO,、mm. so、mm-hmm. we don't really have to follow the. Follow the international protocol,、mm-hmm. and we don't really have to give a shit to WHO says what. We just follow our own ways to deal with the crisis. So that might be some positive.、Yes. But to the WHO, if you're listening, sharing is caring. <laughs>、um, did you wear a doggy tag at school when when you were caught not speaking Mandarin? Yes, and my name has been marked on the blackboard <laughs> saying Freddie Lim. Uh, speaking Taiwanese, <laughs> fine, ten NT dollars. Right. Yes.、Yeah. When did you adopt the name Lim, though? Because your name Lim, you're it's actually Ling, right? Yes. But Ling in Mandarin, it, it's supposed to be L I N, but you spell it L I M. Yeah. When, when did that happen? Uh, I I remember that one of our uh German fan, uh, he is he studied the Eastern Asian culture, so when he's uh when he saw my uh last name, uh the. The kanji is like. This we can put in the video, right? When he saw my last name Lim, 
uh, he asked me, uh, is your family name uh, Hayashi or Lam or Lin? Mm -hmm. He asked me because the same character in Japan, it pronounced Hayashi. Mm -hmm. In uh, Hong Kong, it mm -hmm. pronounced Lam. Mm -hmm. In Mandarin, uh, pro uh, it's pronounced Lin. Mm -hmm. Then that's the moment I, I try to remind, try to think through all the different pronunciation and I just found out that all my father's friends called him Li Mei. Mm. So my family name is not Hayashi, not Lam, mm -hmm. not Lin, mm -hmm. but Lim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's when you became a Lim. Yeah. So that, that was like 2007. So I decided to change my family name and to change my passport uh, information. Is that easy to change your passport name? Not that easy. But after I got elected uh, in 2016, I make it easy now. So people now, if, no matter you speak in Hakka or Taiwanese or Aboriginal, uh, you can change your uh, name with your mother tongue. Uh, That's nice. Yeah, for your official document. Uh, for your uh, for your official documents. I'm glad we just talked about history because um, next I want to talk about your music. Um, all of your music have to do with Taiwan history, Taiwan mm. stories. Uh, before we listen to your newest single, like t tell our audience, this, this is the first episode, right? How do you do your music? What is your music? What is Freddie music? I think uh, I think uh, after we discussed all the, the politics and the history of Taiwan that we have been faced uh, in the last few decades, then I think people sh should be understand much easier th that why we have metal culture in Taiwan because this is that kind of music that can, can express our feelings. We have been through so many uh, so many difficult periods and we even now we have been isolated from the international organizations so uh, with metal i can express myself my anger my rage and uh, for my country having suffered under brutal dictatorship in the past and also the sorrow and pain so so sometimes i feel like the 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 metal has in the some free and wonderful western democratic countries where where are they raised from I, I don't really know maybe they have their own deeper culture but actually uh, sometimes when the Westerners or, or the Western uh, metalheads cannot understand why they are metal in Asia check out Taiwan's history then you will know where our anger is from how did you get into metal? I mean, we're in the land of Teresa Dung and Jay Chow, and like, <laughs> and then there's Freddie. <laughs> I think that uh, um, uh, during my when I was in high school, I listened to a lot of music, uh, uh, classical music too, because I play classical mu uh, piano, and but I listened to heavier and heavier, heavier metal, and because I think that was the the same period that I dig into Taiwan's history and I high I've, school yeah in high school in uh, I can remember uh, when I was like 17 and then I, I I found out that I can't really communicate with my grandma mm. and what happened to me because I used to be, uh, because I was raised by my grandma mm. I can speak uh, fluent uh, Taiwanese with her I should can I, I should keep having very good relationship with her. Mm -hmm. But what happened to me? What happened to my Taiwanese? What happened to my uh, perfect moment with my grandma? And then I tried to dig into Taiwan, Taiwanese history and Taiwanese politics. I found out that there's something wrong with our government. And then I can feel my anger inside me. Mm -hmm. And I need some music for mm -hmm. me to express that kind of you know, feelings. So I listened to metal and I, start, I started to uh, formed my own metal band and started to to write some metal songs. Mm -hmm. mm. What what was what were some of the I guess these were overseas metal bands you were listening to? Yeah. So I, I uh, first of the first of the uh, I I started from uh, thrash metal like Metallica, Slayer, Megadeth, Anthrax, and listened to and from those bands I. Uh, listen to heavier stuff like uh, death metal, black metal, melody death metal, and I need that kind of music uh, with growling, roaring, 
and can bang in my head uh, when I feel when I feel frustrated. So so I know that my parents sometimes my parents uh, found out that I <laughs> was banging my my head in my room alone after I read some books. <laughs> Uh, was it difficult to find other um, metal people? I mean, because this is early 90s, right? Mm, yeah, right. very difficult. So early 90s. So I Taiwan would say that all the other kids, they, they have even more difficult times than me. Because I find my way out. I find right, my way to right, express right. my feelings. But for Taiwan, that was an age of exploration, right? We just yeah. came out of martial law. Yeah. You know, social movements were, were, yeah. were rising. We're, it and it not was that, allowed to. So. And, but actually, most of the kids, they just started to to enjoy their free life so they didn't really dig into the history so maybe they didn't find the same anger like me <laughs> like what I found in, inside me so you found some <laughs> other very angry people to join to, to, to form yeah, a band yeah, with you yes yes and what's the metal scene like today uh, there are more and more uh, younger metal bands in Taiwan now and there are a lot of uh, even in high school in junior high schools that we can see uh, I I, uh, I can in the last uh, two decades, there, there have been more and more young kids forming new metal bands, even the girls. There are some very good female vocalists as well. They can shout, they can scream. Oh yeah, we shout. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to say is that Taiwan, uh, Taiwan is kind of one of, one of the important uh, countries that all the international metal bands, if they want to tour Asia, they will definitely come to Japan, Taiwan, and Indonesia and Australia. Yeah, Taiwan is one of the important stuff. Yeah. How, how many years uh, was it, until, how many years into the band until you, you did your first international tour? Um, about 10 years, yeah. Uh, I, won't, I don't want to, I <laughs> uh, we formed the band uh, in late 90s. So <laughs> with uh, our first uh, There's a Wikipedia, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, we started our first uh, international tour in 2003, four. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't. I don't want to be that old. <laughs> You're not that old. That's not old. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Anyway. So yeah, but so thank God that uh, after I been elected in the parliament, I still try to uh, write songs. I, I used to, uh, when I decided to get involved in politics, when I decided to run for the parliament, I thought that I, there will be a, a, a few years that I, I wouldn't write any materials. I thought that I will totally, uh, I will totally stop writing. But you stayed angry. Yes. <laughs> That's the, that's the point that I, I found out that in politics, there are not just anger, but there are so many different uh, emotions that drive me to write more music. And uh, the, the album that released in 2018 actually expressed my uh, emotions in different uh, perspectives. So I think I think that's very uh, important. That's uh, to be involved in the politics, to be in the parliament, ha has uh, really made me write some different music. Even, although it's still metal, but uh, share different feelings, and emotions. Yeah, we teamed up with Matt Heafy of Trivium to do a rearrangement of Supreme Pain for the Tyrant, uh, which was the song from 2013. And this time we do the rearrangement for the 50th anniversary of the attempted, uh, 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 for the attempted assassination of uh, Jiang Jingguo. Jiang Jingguo, so that's Chiang Kai-shek's Kai son. Kai son. Yes. They ran mm. a family business of ruling Taiwan. Uh, yes. So the reason why I think this attempt assassination is very important for Taiwan's history is because that uh, in that in back in 70s that was still when the Jiang Jingguo and Jiang Kai-shek the KMT government called Taiwan free China with his friends in the western world for their propaganda against the communists uh, during the cold war they need Taiwan to be 
free China. Mm -hmm. But actually, Taiwanese have been struggle from uh, from uh, have. Uh, but actually, the Taiwanese have been suffer from the dictatorship uh, of KMT government and uh, Jiang Kai Shek and Jiang Jingguo. So, so it's so difficult for Taiwanese to let the international community knows what happened in Taiwan because the, the world need Taiwan to be free China. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you need to be a free country mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. their propaganda. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's Taiwanese suffer. Oh, they ran a beautiful, beautiful campaign, right? So um, <laughs> um, Chiang Kai-shek's wife, So Ming Ling, I mean, she, yeah. when she spoke at the Joint Congress, I, I believe she was the first non-American to do that. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. She, yeah. she was the first non-American citizen to address the Joint House. I mean, that's yeah. incredible, right? Yeah. So that's that. they need that kind of propaganda. They want to sell that kind of, of story to the international uh, community. And that's... So uh, there's... They, uh, it was very difficult for Taiwanese to let the world know that Taiwanese is dying, has been put in jails without... Uh, formal judicial uh, process and it's so difficult for Taiwanese. So the Peter Huang, the uh, the, the so so by the 1970s, uh, yeah. KMT had already it had been already been 20 so years of martial law, right? So they started yeah. martial law in 1949, which when it was finally lifted in 87, it was 38 years. It was the longest martial law in history at the time. So 70s were around time when. They had they spent 20 years kind of finding kind of the anti pro communist people in China, and then yeah. from the 70s on, it was targeting kind of the more Taiwan minded kind of the elites and activists, right? Yeah. This is this is where Huang Wenxiong fit in. Yeah. So Huang Wenxiong, Peter Huang, uh, he was one of uh, the activists in the U.S. Uh, wanted to 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 remind the world that uh, the the story the Chiang Kai. Uh, the story of Chiang Kai-shek want to sell to the world is not true. So the uh, he decided to uh, he decided to assassinate Jiang Jingguo when he visited New York. And but but any but anyway he failed. And but actually that action from him and his colleagues make the world realize that wow there's something wrong with Taiwan. Mm. Yeah, because there's some some guy even in the U.S. and willing to do that kind of uh, risky move. And mm -hmm. there must be something wrong in Taiwan. So that was the moment the international society and the international human rights organization started to monitor Taiwan and to support Taiwan's democratic movements. So I would say that that's one of the key moments that drive Taiwan's democratic movements. And that's why I, I think it's quite important for its 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's still alive today. Yeah, right? he's still alive. Still my mentor. I, I just met him a few weeks ago, and he's very passionate, a very soft guy. Actually, you can't really you can't imagine how he decided to do that. Right. And he right, right. he's my uh, pre he's my predecessor as head of Amnesty International Taiwan, and he. Uh, I can remember that when I decided to run for the parliament, I called him and mm -hmm. chat for like two hours. <laughs> is he supportive? What do you say? Yeah, he is very supportive, and and but yeah, he always want to remind me that not just not just want to fight against the 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 authoritarian regime, mm -hmm. not just want to fight against the tyranny, but also mm -hmm. try to protect the people you love, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. to protect the people who suffer from. The the the, uh, the the people who are in the f the worst cases. So yeah, he's my mentor. So I think this song is for him and for all the people who mm. who have who uh, for all the people who fight against the the uh, tyrant. Mm. Yes. So what happened? So he was uh, caught on the day because it was an attempted assassination. He he didn't succeed, right? He was caught right away. Yes, and he shouted out, uh, "Let me stand up like a Taiwanese." So that's that's the line we put in the song, and that's the line when no matter when we play in Taiwan or uh, other countries, yeah. the, all the fans will shout it out with us in yeah, those lines. Yeah. It's yeah. Very, 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 very emotional line. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I guess he came back to Taiwan finally um, in 1996, right after yeah. our first 
direct presidential election. Yes. So and actually he didn't been he, he actually he hasn't been caught in the U.S. He has been oh. he, actually he has been caught, but he jumped bail in the U.S. <laughs> so so for 25 years they never caught him <laughs> in the U.S. So I think that's kind of I think there there will be a documentary about him definitely. He always didn't want to say where he has. Hiding, where uh, he I, has I don't think he himself. should tell. He don't. I don't think. He should, right? <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, those are kind of the refugee and uh, uh, lifelines that you want to preserve, right? The next yeah. time we have something like this, I, I don't yeah. think that these things should be told at all. I mean, he should, he should give hints of it, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think the direct route that needs to be protected, right? Yes, yes. He shouldn't tell, but he, sh uh, he shouldn't tell, but he can tell me. <laughs> I wouldn't tell. <laughs> right. We will get it out of you. No. Um, yeah, or maybe maybe there'll be a good uh, movie on it one day too. Yes, definitely. A drama drama yeah. film. Yeah. Um, so I've got the lyrics in front of me, and I'll just read a couple of lines, um, and I will try to do it justice. With these hands, I wash the blood clean. Watch it flow past visions of scene. Let me stand up like a Taiwanese. Only justice will bring you peace. Those are the lines that fans like mostly. So, yeah. Next time you should come to our concert. I would love to. Yes. When is the next concert? Uh, I don't know, actually. <laughs> maybe December. Not sure yet, but maybe December. Hopefully the pandemic gone by then. Cool, and let's have a listen. And if you're in front of the computer, you can look up the song, um, look up the music video. It's fully animated. It's a really cool music video. Yes, and uh, in the meantime, you can check out our YouTube channel, and you will find out that the uh, Taiwan Victory, Taiwan Da Kaishen concerts have been on our YouTube fully. So you can see, uh, I, I know that most of the fans can't really be in the front lines of the stage because it's very crowded. Uh, last year, but you can check out the whole concerts online now. Cool, and we'll have all the links in the show notes as well. All right, Freddie, this has uh, been much longer than we had planned. But <laughs> much, I've much longer. So yes. much fun. <laughs> so much fun and uh, so challenging. All right, I'm glad we're yes. doing this, and uh, yeah. let's record again. My pleasure. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks. This is Emily Wai Wu. Thank you. I'm Freddie Lim. Thanks for listening to the first episode. Thanks for listening to the first episode of Metalhead Politics, a co-production of Thonic and Ghost Island Media and the Midog Project. Subscribe on all podcast apps. Tell your Metalhead friends, your politics junkies, and your Taiwan lovers about the show. Look us up on social media. Our Twitters are all very easy to find. It's Thonic, uh, it's at Thonic TW, at Freddie Lim, at Emily Waiwu and at Ghost Island Me. Again, we'll have all these links in the show notes. And here it is, the new single by Thonic, Preen Pain for the Tyrant, featuring Matt Heavey of Trivium. <laughs>